All right, we are gathered here today to discuss the color of law. Uh, yet another, um, yet another, another very dense catalog of facts <laughs> coming to us. So, um, Lucy, this book you actually got me pretty excited about because in one of the earlier discussions you mentioned this book and you mentioned. Mm -hmm specifically that you had learned a lot during this book and yeah. um you know and I hope this isn't embarrassing but like after seeing the uh being exposed to um the way that you read deeply in these discussions I was like mm -hmm. okay if Lucy said she learned a lot I am excited to read this book um yeah. so thank you for thank you for mentioning it because it was uh it was kind of fun to go into a book with like that level of like all right Lucy said she got something out of this. I feel like I'm going to get something out of this book. Okay. Well, I hope um, you so, you know, just for anybody who's watching this book sort of, um, and maybe, maybe I'm going to say what I'm going to say and like, I'll, and invite you guys to tag onto it. If you think that I missed something, but essentially um, this book argues, um, argues that residential segregation is actually um more law, more um, letter of the law than spirit of the law. Um, and then he continues to follow that thread into the different ways that it impacts um, American life, right? Like in terms of what outcomes look like um, and how outcomes are the same and how they're the different, how they're different across groups that were impacted by this, um, by this uh, system sanctioned segregation. Does that feel like an appropriate summary, an appropriate elevator summary of this book? Yes. Yeah. All right. So um, I guess I guess I'm going to ask my standard question: uh, what what was what is this book in conversation with in your mind? What else are you taking in, thinking about, reading um, that you know this book was touching upon as you were moving through it, or thinking about it if you're looking at it for a second time? Um, well, for me, it was definitely in conversation with White Rage that we read. Um, I think it's going to be hard for me to not have that in conversation with everything that I read now about any kind of system, system, systemic oppression. Um, it just really laid the groundwork and kind of a framework for thinking about um, oppression in a way that is helpful to think about um, instead of thinking about like, uh, you know, this happened and it affected black people more like kind of by accident I think intentionally thinking of it as a like as a result of white rage I think really helped me frame that and then this book when it was laying out like the whole the dates and the times and the the cases and the whatever like it to me it, it was constantly thinking about the rage that fueled all of those intentional actions Yeah, I, I would say it's, I read it initially a while ago, and I think that's why I brought it up, Sherlanya, in a discussion. Um, and I think when I was reading it, I was also maybe reading The New Jim Crow. And it's just interesting for me to see how this book, Color of Law, like, I think because he talks about the the jury segregation, like how that has these ripple effects out into everything. So then reading like the new Jim Crow and thinking about this system of mass incarceration and how there just is this like through line between, um, you know, these systems that were put in place um, by the federal government, essentially. Um, in reviewing it for this discussion today, one thing that um, just really jumped out at me was reading the parts about, um, like when when black people would move into a white neighborhood mistakenly or like someone would sell them a house they weren't supposed to and the police sanctioned mob activity that followed that um it was really hard not to read that without me directly reflecting on like the current events around us that we're seeing in the news right now so um i think what I found so interesting about this book is I feel like it relates to so many of the things that I've read in the past year. And I just, that it's so indicative of how the, the system is constructed carefully to create the situation. Yeah. Um, 
So one of the stories in this book made me think about, I, I don't, you guys may or may not know this, but once upon a time, I was trying to do a project where I, I wanted to um, research different race riots and then like break them down, like, ver- like into like just sentences and images. Um, and so I had this website where I was starting to do that. And then I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Like I cannot be in this space all the time. Right. Because like, what, what I knew going into that is uh, what I was thinking about going into that. It's like, when we think about like a race riot um, and now, and now I feel like commonly um, language that is being used is more nuanced than it was like it. I think that I was thinking about this in 2015 or something like that, or, um, and I started thinking about the idea before that, but you know, you think about like Watts, you think about like all, you think about the um, instances where you will hear somebody on the news say like, I don't know why they would do this in their own community, but I had an understanding that like most of this, like um, most of this explosive violence, right? Um, When you go back case by case involved, you know, mob violence against black people, right? And so what I wanted to do was like, at random, choose these different things. And this book made me think about it, right? Like reading about some of the experiences that people had in this book reminded me like, yep. And this is the stuff that you wanted to stop reading about all the time when you quit that other project, because um, I don't know, just one thing I think that he does a really good job at, like, even though he's talking about like all these cases and all these laws and all these specific details is that human element of it. Right. I feel like even though he presented a lot of data, he presented it in a way where you see um, in some cases where you see the strivings of individuals and then like the um, and then the you know ton of bricks that rained down uh, upon people when they were just trying to trying to live. Right. Um, and so that was. That was one thing that was in my head. And then the other thing that was in my head a lot, um, because, you know, he talks a lot about, you know, like, du, du, I can't even say it, de jure. Um, you hear that word or see that word throughout this book. And it reminded me a lot about the class, like the original history class I took at U of M where the, um, where the uh, GSI was making this distinction. I remember it was like this class that was 1865 to present. And so we picked up it, you know, um, we picked up leading into reconstruction and he talked a lot about like the difference between like de facto and de jury. And so it was kind of interesting to read this book here and now, and then like uh, be taken back to that original class. In fact, one of the, one of the movies on this, uh, on this list is something that, that he made us watch actually so it's kind of this funny like for me personally it's funny like bookend of um of engaging with um with american history really um so i like this book because it was specifically talking about um residential segregation made me what, I was like, are, are you going to ask people this? But I am going to ask. So did this make you think about neighborhoods that you grew up in or lived in throughout your, I thought so, because like, how do you read this book without thinking about it? Um, so I'm curious, like what, what, what neighbor, what did you guys' neighborhoods look like just out of curiosity? And then how would you see them? How did you see them then if you thought about it at all? Um, and how would you think about them now? Like if you're describing and like, just maybe choose one. I mean, we've all lived in multiple, most of us, I guess, have lived in multiple neighborhoods. Um, well, I grew up um, right, outside, right outside of Boston, like 10 minutes outside of Boston. So Boston is um, an extremely segregated city. Like the, and um, so I grew up in a neighborhood that was all white and, um, I, I didn't, I'm sadly, I didn't think about it. It wasn't presented to me to think about. Um, now, like I just know so much more about the area I was living in now as an adult. And so it's, 
it's really easy to look at that entire area and just see the lines. And some of that has changed within the city, um, but really because of gentrification and, and also it's an expensive city and things change, but where the, the surrounding areas and like where I lived has not changed at all. And as an adult, I'm um, like, I'm disappointed. I, I didn't know a way to seek the information when I was little, but I'm, and actually a lot of the reading that I've done this past year has made me disappointed in the education that I received about um, the history of where I was living or the history of this country and the surroundings. And so it's just, I have two very different feelings about like my feelings when I was little growing up or one thing, when I look back on that place now, I feel very differently. And reading this book was just, just made me think about that and other places I've lived too. Um, so. Mm, I grew up in Ann Arbor. <laughs> um, so yeah, when I was a kid, there were maybe two or three black kids in my like bus route to school. Um, which at the time I did not really think about at all. Um, and then like, I didn't even know that there was like a black part of Ann Arbor or a historically black part. Like it just never, we never really talked. I don't remember ever talking about it or learning about it. Um, there was a section that like on my bus route was more low income and, uh, it was definitely like higher concentration of my black co-work, uh, co not co-workers, uh, co-students, <laughs> classmates, that's the word, um, lived there. And definitely like, that was kind of my first exposure to thinking about it of just like, hmm, yeah, they all, like many of them live in that neighborhood here. And then the bus, you know, makes the corner and then down here and then that's my neighborhood. And, but yeah, I didn't really think about it a lot until probably high school because I went to community high school where you have to apply to go. There's a lottery system because they can only take so many students. Um, and I remember at the time, this is kind of a tangent, there were a lot of concerns about did we have enough black students that they weren't applying to or getting into community, um, which at the time as a kid, it was more thought about of like, well, they're just not applying. They don't want to come here and not anything about like, why wouldn't they want to come or reasons or neighborhoods or anything like that. Yeah, so I, I grew up in Flint um, and I feel like um, the reason I ask the question about like, uh, how do you see it? How do you see like where you grew up now versus how you see it um, in the past is because um, it's because like now I feel like I, like I, um, 10 years ago, I would have said, you know, I feel like I grew up in like mixed neighborhoods because, um, because like there were definitely black people in our neighborhood and they're definitely in, in both the neighborhoods that I um, lived in as a kid. And they're both, and there definitely were like white people in the neighborhood. Right. But like now, uh, mm, so like po point A, point B, like I definitely rec recognize that um, throughout like school school and then like time, like I've moved into like whiter and whiter and whiter and whiter spaces, right? And so I think that there are situations where then I would have just been in a space and been like, okay, this is, this is a regular space. Like now I would experience that space. It's like, wow, there's so many, there's so many black people here, right? And it's just, it's a matter of, like, I think about, um, it makes me think about like how like what you see daily impacts the way that you see something else right because like how can it you know you ask yourself the question of like man these two things look very different um and it, and it's just a really a matter of like what you're what you're around right um and the daily situation or even i'm like were they how mixed were these classrooms you know like they felt mixed to you because they weren't all black but would you look at it now and think it was like think of it as like a, a like a predominantly black classroom mm -hmm. and like with some of the earlier ones I, you know I cannot remember enough 
um, about like, I'm like, okay, like who can you remember, right? Um, and it's just kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. To me, it's interesting to think about and like, what is that? What is it? And what does that mean, right? Like when when you're no longer like looking at a situation like, oh yeah, this feels normal. This feels, or this feels like the norm. And like now it doesn't necessarily feel like the norm. And what does that, what does that mean? Mm-hmm. You know? I think it was towards the end of the book, they were talking about people's perception of integrated and what that meant. And white people, when they asked, they thought that um, for a space to be integrated, it would mean like 10% non-white. Whereas if you ask like people of color, they would ask like, say like 40, 50%. And because I remember growing up, people would always say how diverse Ann Arbor was. And I was like, and then when I was working in Detroit, I was like, hmm, (laughs) these are not the same, (laughs) like at all. And these are both places that people tell me are diverse and whatever, and they don't look the same, certainly. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So um, what surprised you in this book? Or what would have surprised you about this book if you had read it one year ago after, what would have surprised you if you read it, like if this was the first book in this long series of reading? Because I know that both of you guys have done a lot of these books. And so maybe it's not even fair for me to ask the question, what surprised you like here? Um, Like what would have surprised you a year ago? Maybe it's the better question or the question that might bear more fruit. (laughs) I mean, initially, initially like this book, and I did read it a, a while ago and then I've just been reviewing it, but I mean, the book in and of itself was surprising to me. And I think that's why I was like, I learned so much from this book because I, I don't think that the, I think that the, we're told this myth of this de facto segregation, that it's just happened because it was driven by private parties or real estate agents, or it's just the way it shook out. And I think to learn that like, you know, to, like there was no, there was never public housing in this country that until it was created by Roosevelt and it was created, it was segregated from the beginning. It's just like those markers and those pieces were in place so early on when things were getting developed. Um, and I just, so I was just, I was really surprised by that. I don't think that that, um, I mean, it's not something that I had heard about and I don't think that it, is like widely discussed. Um, I think it should be, <laughs> but so, I mean, the book in itself was surprising to me. I feel like um, one of the things that I felt surprised by, I guess, when I was reading this book is, is the fact that this book could literally be used to answer a lot of questions that I feel are um, thrown out in order to stop a conversation about like systemic racism, right? You know, um, cause I feel like sometimes like there are these, well, you know, well, it's nobody's fault if all those people just live in an area that has bad schools, why don't they just move to another area? Like, I feel like it answers a lot of the um, questions that can be posed as like, it's not, I feel like if, he, if somebody is making the argument, like it's not systemic racism that's impacting our lives. It is a set of bad choices. I feel like this book, he argues against, he argues that point, right? Cause it's like, well, let, let's, let's back up. And just to see that like argued um, brick by brick was very like, oh, okay, this story looks very, uh, the story looks a very particular way when you're looking at it through this lens. Um, and that was super interesting. And like, um, there are all sorts of things, like I wasn't aware either that like, oh, okay, public housing happened in this particular way and this is who it was for. And then, and then it was like maintained in the segregated fashion. And then it came to be, re- then it came to represent something else. And you would never know, like you would never know right now. And I'm, of course, I'm using a general you. You would never know that public housing was like kind of built for white people, you know, like, cause we don't associate 
white people with public housing. You think about like you, I bet if you just said public housing, like people would just start naming like famous ones that became famous because of like race related stuff, you know, like you, you so I, I thought that that was, that was something that stood out about this book and just the dry step-by-step -step argument of it. Like, while, while I do think that he did a really good job of like showing that there are people on the other side of it, he also did a very good job of being like, exhibit A, exhibit B, mm -hmm. exhibit C. And then he anticipated um, the arguments that would come out of resistance to the ideas that he's pre presenting. I just felt like he was like, all right, now I know that you're about to try to get off on exit seven, but behold the scenery on exit seven, you know? And I thought that that was really um, interesting. I didn't expect him to take the bull by the horns in that way. And part of that, part of the reason is because of, I can't remember what it was specifically, but it was, it had to do with the, um, the way that the introduction was written and the, the way that he talked about language choices that he was making in the book. Um, because he did say something about, oh, I think it, he was, um, talking about using the word ghettos, right? And then when I was reading that, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't know what, I don't know what we have in store. Cause like it's, st that stood out to me. And then he also made rent, he made mention of um, the, uh, uh, the um, Jim Crow book, that full name that is escaping me. Cause she used it too. She used that word throughout the book and that stood out to me. And I felt like, I don't know how I feel about that this when I was reading it, but I know that the use of that word was very intentional. Um, and then here, because he brought it up and then he mentioned, he mentioned that book as well. But I was like, I, I, I don't know what I'm in store for here because like that, I, if, for me, that is a super loaded word. Um, and if I see somebody using it, I automatically am like, all right, I, I need to dissect your motivations here. Um, yeah, I have a lot of also feelings about that, but uh, <laughs> back to the question of like something I found surprising was just how much where we live determines everything about our life. Um, I mean, it definitely in like the cult of meritocracy that we preach of like, doesn't matter your, where you came from, if you're smart, you'll rise above whatever classes, you know, um, but just how much it is really holding people back from education funding to the schools to everything, like job employment, access to transportation, just like, and how all of that stacks and stacks and stacks on itself um, to make a really impossible situation for people. Um, so I think I was kind of surprised by like the bulk of that, which when you're learning about things, it's like, okay, you learn about crime and you learn about housing and there was redlining and then it's like when you were looking at everything it's it's a lot um and then the other thing that is this really more specific thing that has um that I've still been thinking a lot about has been um I guess just taking for granted policies of like this is how it is this is the policy because whatever reasoning and so when he was talking about the section eight housing vouchers and how there's a limited number of them because I've worked in enough like public um, positions where I've known, like usually there's a waiting list, you have to apply to it, you have to get accepted. Even then it's like not necessarily a guarantee that there will be housing to accept your voucher. Like just that process is notoriously difficult. Um, and his just questioning of like, why are there a limited number of vouchers? When everyone who owns a home, there's income, you know, there's tax credits for owning your own home. There's all this different stuff and like, there's no limit on that. There's no limit to how many people use those tax credits. Um, so why should we limit the number of public housing opportunities there are? Um, and that has really stuck with me. Yeah, you are making me think about, um, you know, when, you, when you're saying like the, when you're talking about the, um, difficulty of that process like even that is a thing that I think um is 
I think that for some people is unknown, right? Like if you're, if you interface with that system or if you interface with someone who's trying to gain access to um, section eight housing, you might, you might understand that it's not like a given, but I think it's one of those things that's like used to like um, make people see us as in thems, right? Because like, if you don't understand that that's a system that is like notoriously convoluted, you might think that like, those people, whoever you think that they are in your mind, just get free housing, right? And that's the kind of ideas that that you hear, right? It's like, oh, well, they get handouts, whoever that they is, right? Because like every speaker is imagining somebody else. But I think that that's interesting too, because it's not, I don't, because I don't think it's common to know um, like what you're just pointing out, right? Like, Okay, so like here are all the hoops that you have to jump into for this thing that you may have heard of these these folks who you um, think you don't want in your neighborhood, right? Um, and here are all these free things you're getting, like in terms of like tax credits and this and that other. Like no, like that stuff lives in different drawers, right? I think, and I don't think that's accidental. I think that these books have have shown us how little of what we think is accidental. Um, so there, he had several cases of people trying to, um, trying to do the right thing in this book and, um, and not cases, and these cases were not like fairy tale happy ending cases. So, um, I don't know. I that stands out. So I was just wondering what your thoughts were on that. You, you know about the um about the facts themselves, or even about like about the way that he laid that out as a literary device. Um, thoughts, feelings. <laughs> well, I think whatever you, I mean, for me, like when you start to put a um like a more, it's not personal to him, but an anecdote in a in a book that has a name attached to it um I, I think that it, it works I mean like because it 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 takes you out of the statistics a little bit and, and the numbers and just says like this is how this looks for a real person in real life um and then there's like in this book one of the situations that stuck out to me was that with um William Styron when he was trying to build that like cooperative housing because he's a, it's a name that I've heard also just like it, it clicks something like, oh, William Starr, I know that, but I never knew that part of his life or I never knew that he tried to do this thing and, you know, um, was not allowed to continue with it because there were going to be black people living in this cooperative housing. Um, so I, I think that like as a, a device, I found it to be successful. Um, and that was just one example, but, um, because because this book is filled with a lot of like facts and statistics, um, which are supportive and helpful, but I think it for me it helped to kind of see how it looked outside of those numbers. You watched me like lean over to look at my notes. <laughs> um, so I thought that he did a good job of showing how wealth accumulates in this book. Um, and so I was just curious about, uh, you know, about how other people reacted to that. I mean, one of the things that I've been thinking about and in some cases asking in these is like, I, I guess the thought is like, okay, so like we, we keep reading this material and what do you do with it now, right? Cause like, what do you do with it? And then another question that I asked at, about one of the books, because I thought that book was like, because I couldn't imagine recommending it to someone. Um, you know, I was like, who would you recommend this book to? And I guess that that's sort of where this question comes from. Because to, to me, I feel like this book makes a really good, reasonable um, case about like how the accumulation of wealth looks. And this book is not set in the distant past, right? Like a lot of what he's talking about is what you is is you know less less than a hundred years old, less than fifty years old, but has like very um, but the roadmap from there to here is real clear. Um, 
And so I guess instead of asking a question, I just threw out some loosely webbed thoughts. And I'm wondering how you guys are thinking about that web. Um, well, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, I think a lot of the stuff we've read has made me think a lot about the, the value gap. And I think he really did a good job of showing how much of that comes from like home equity and inherited wealth that you don't get if you don't have a home. And it's interesting, like you look at the example of Levittown, um, you know, that those homes were affordable when they were created only for white people. But then if you if you had inherited that and inherited that, you could turn around and sell it now for like $700,000. You know, that's just, um, I forget where I'm going with this, but it just, it, it, it's like, I just kept thinking about the, this book does exemplify the wealth gap and how, and like a really concrete example of how it was, created um and like for you saying it's not that long ago like it it was in you know the 1950s but even still today it's like if that was some if that house was yours in your family and it was passed on i mean that just that that generational wealth is still a very big piece today of the value gap and um that's not that's not new information or anything, but I do think that this is a book I would say, like, if this doesn't affect you, like if you're on the, the end of having that general gener um, generational wealth or you, like, you don't have to know the information in this book. You know, it, it's, um, you could be comfortable without knowing it, but you should know it. It's important to know. And so it's like, I feel like this is a book that I would like to hand everyone because it's just like, this is part of the system you live in. And, um... Yeah, housing is such a current issue too of like, yeah, this is really recent history. This isn't so long ago. This is, you know, my parents, my grandparents, like that is not long ago. Um, and then now, especially we've seen it too with um, housing prices and, you know, millennials are getting ready to buy houses or trying to look for houses. Um, and there's just not there. They can't compete with the wealth of the boomers. The boomers had white boomers had, you know, easy access to get cheap houses. They're selling those houses in, you know, San Francisco and then going and being able like having all this wealth that they've accumulated from the house, from the location, from whatever. And it's just then wages stagnated. I mean, our generation now is, like what do people do if you can't find a house? And I think that so much of that is rooted in, in race and just in how you can accumulate wealth, um, who's able to, who's not, and how tied that is to education. If home prices determine school funding, um, I was thinking a lot about another book I had read um, basically about social movements and like, okay, overnight, you know, snap of the fingers, all income and property is redistributed evenly across all people. You're still going to have like social capital that people have built up from education, from who they know, all of that. Um, and so it's not just housing. It's also who, like what educations were people able to get, then what colleges were they able to get into? Were they able to afford college? Are then they still having student loan debt? Just like everything is all kind of connected. Um, and it's really hard to break out of. Um, and I was intrigued at his ending. Um, he didn't call it read, um, not reparations. He used another word, which I'm blanking on. He's re redressing. Isn't that how he doesn't he? Yeah. Um, how it's like not a perfect system, but it's something and it's, you know, there's like, I can't see us doing a whole, you know, land distribution, everything like that. <laughs> what could the U.S. do? What could, what can we make palatable to people? Um, I don't know. It's, it's, it feels really big um, for people when people are just wanting, you know, a job in a house and some kind of security and, 
I don't know, it feels very difficult to take on. You made me think when you're talking about, um, talking about like um, millennials being unable to purchase homes, like it made me think about this idea that, um, that I've had in the back of my head through a lot of this, re this reading, but it's like sometimes racism casts, casts a net that just nets other people too, you know, mm -hmm. and we don't, and I, and I guess this is probably more like mental exercise than anything else, but I wonder, you know, I wonder how understanding that would change the way that we look at racism, right? Because like if you, like if you're in a position where you're allowed to think that you don't, you're raceless, like you're the raceless neutral, mm -hmm. right? Like you can then think that racism is something that doesn't impact you. But if you think of racism as something that casts like these crazy nets all over the place, and sometimes it's going to get somebody else and that somebody else might be you or yours. I wonder if that changes the game a little bit. I mean, that's, you know, that's how I, that's how I am thinking about some of the, um, you know, some of the uh, legislation that's trying to um, legislate people's bodies. It's like, if we think about that as something that only applies to those people in this, in this case, I guess the other thing that's in my mind that, um, that I could have said at the beginning is thinking about some of these you know, some of these laws that are detrimental to um, like trans children seeking the medical um, attention that they should, they as people should feel like they should be able to have between them and their doctors or whatever. And um, so, you know, if we think that that's something that only applies to a small group of people, then I think it's easy to just like, turn a blind eye or even say something less blind eye, but like, well, but like how many people does that impact? But those nets never only hit their target. Like those nets are going to be like doorways into not, not to say that like those folks who are impacted that their lives, that's enough, that's enough of a reason to be like, wait, what? But it's also it's also a net that's going to catch others. Like all of these nets catch other people, which, I, you know, again, I don't, I don't even know what to do with that or how to think about that or how to talk about that. But this is an example, I think, of that, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that makes me think too about even like from a, um, like a legal standpoint, you know, you look at this book, so much of this is set up in, in like by the Supreme Court, but we have such a history like and such a reliance on precedence in in legal mm -hmm. proceedings. And so if something, if some decision is made about a group of people and you think that it doesn't affect you or whether it's decision that benefits them or harms them, like that once that decision is made that that can then be turned around and applied mm -hmm. to other groups um, and I, I think it is. And so it just, that just popped into my head when you were talking about that net and how like there's this, um, social net, but like legally too, I just think that those there's, you know, the precedence, um, is kind of a convenient tool sometimes to be like, well, we did it that way once. So, or we didn't do it that way. So we're not going to do it now. Yep. And I think that lawmakers understand it, that tool very well, right? Because mm -hmm. it, like they're, they're always waiting for the case. It's going to be the case that like turns into the thing that's going to like unfold into the ultimate goal. Right. And so that, I, I feel like that's another argument that like this book and um, in the collection of books makes it's like, man, we all need to be paying closer attention to like these minor or like what we think of as like minor things. Cause it's what's turning into, those are the building blocks. Right. And those are things that are like more easily in our reach to do something about, right. Like those small offices, you know, um, the, the boring meetings about like how various things are run, like that's where a lot of um, 
that's where that's the room where a lot of stuff is happening, right? Like we think about like the big offices, you know, and the symbolism and what they come to under come to represent, but like there's so much in these small little places. Um, and we, and, and there are people who understand that who are like stepping into those places, you know, like there's a current story that I'm covering because not covering, I'm following because I'm just nosy, but like inside, and it's not relevant to the discussion really, but like inside of that, even it's like the person who took this office that turned into like this whole national story understood the power that lived in that office like you would look at that office and think like what does that person even do but that guy knew what that person did right and like you know you guys were talking about marissa you were talking about like even if everything was like re, even if all like property or whatever was redistributed like this up uh, the social stuff is still there right and like that knowledge is still there like that guy knew what he knew because of his family and who they're connected to right and so like those folks know like where to go to like re 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 grab everything and so that's interesting too i mean i feel like this book and i want to read the some of us because i feel like that book would be like a really good compliment to um to the stuff that we've read but like, I feel like, I feel like we could teach U.S. history through a course called hoarding, right? And then just like look at the different ways that like people attempted to hoard um, the things that like make one's life easy, like hoarding resources, hoarding land, hoarding money, hoarding, you know, education, hoarding all of these things. Um, but that's like, but that's like, that's a story that's, not the myth, you know what I mean? Like you can't, you can't uh, put the myth forward or like the progress narrative forward if you're looking dead at the hoarding um, that that happens. I purposefully use like a word like that where it's like a word that we use casually, you know, and it's just like, because it is something that's like everywhere and people are doing it like pretty casually, right? Um, so he raises the question of how to, undo this <laughs> so what what did that make you think <laughs> I liked I liked hearing the question raised I mean I think um you know this book was written in 2017 but I feel like it's kind of um had a resurgence. And I think that, like, that that question needs to be asked before anything happens, you know? So um, like you were saying before, Morris, that does feel so big and it is, I mean, it's, it's a different change than like access to, um, you know, buses or a lunch counter or it's just like, there's so much and it goes back so far. Mm -hmm. But I think that, um, pointing it out and saying, what, what are we going to do is like a good, a good place to start. And also I, I think because he makes the case over and over again, like if something is de facto, if it just happened because, because of private citizens or then like, it's up to them to undo it. Right. But if something is de jure and like if the federal government made these, these things happen, then they have to help. There has to be a hand from them in undoing it. Um, it doesn't make it easier to, to fix, but. Um, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, it's, I appreciated his kind of suggestions just because they felt like real suggestions. I can't say that I fully understood everything that he talked about or how it would work with like selling land and different projects and whatever. Like I was kind of just like, okay, this is an idea, that's interesting. Um, definitely not my area of expertise. I don't fully understand it, but okay. <laughs> um, but this whole um, question, I was glad to see it raised. I think this interfaces a lot with um, kind of the shield of white fragility and white guilt, um, because a lot of this has to happen through political will, right? Like people have to want it people in power have to want it 
or be pressured to do something about it. Um, and I think it's kind of, even if you're feeling guilty or feeling whatever feelings you have, um, I think it can be kind of a stopping point for people um, or seeing this big mountain of work and not necessarily knowing how to start. It kind of seems like it needs a lot of different people in different places um, working on it, like not just housing, not just criminal justice reform, not just education, not like all of the things. Um, but yeah, then thinking about just the guilt that I think it's not to say it's not real, but I think it can be used as kind of a shield to um, avoid it, I guess, is a way to say it. I'm not sure if I'm, but uh, yeah, I don't know how to make people care. <laughs> Yeah, I was surprised when the book went down that road. I was like, oh, oh, we're, we're like, I was like, I was literally like, oh, we're going here, huh? You know, and so it was, it was hard to, I was just like, wow. But then like reading this right after White Rage, I was like, I'm not prepared to think about this right now, right? Like, I just felt like I am not prepared to imagine the rage um, you know, like imagine the backlash. So like I'm using short and right. As if, as if we we're like talking out of the book, but I'm like, I am not prepared to even think about the backlash. Like if somebody tried to like enact, like, you know, in a sweeping way, um, the suggestions, it was just mm -hmm. like, whew. Like we just spent, we just spent this book and some of these other books talking about like the, um, talking about what resistance looks like. And a lot of times that resistance looks super violent or that resistance um, looks like, you know, people losing a lot, right? Like, yeah, like, yeah, I don't know, your neighborhood being raised for a, you know, highway, right? Or like, you know, your, it, it just was like, oof. Like, how do you get from point A to point B without like further injuring people? Mm -hmm. You know, because it's not like, because it's not like you can say like, all right, so we're going to do this and we're going to put like a, what, force field around the people who are normally hurt by things to make sure, like it was just, like I said, coming off a of white rage, I think I was just like not prepared to engage with like, can this, can this happen in a way that's not going to be like, not going to cost more people their lives and their livelihoods. It's interesting. I was listening to a um, podcast that Richard Rusting was on in like September of 2020, so pretty recent. And um, his thoughts at that point were like, there has to be a new civil rights movement around this. Like that is gonna be the way to start to implement these changes. Um, like that's what was effective at the 50s and 60s and that's gonna need to happen now. But it's like what you're saying, Sherlania, is, is who has to put themselves out there, right? And like, put themselves in the path of violence or danger or any of those things in order to make those changes. And so it, it is, um, it's just hard to, I mean, I understood what he was saying. I think it's also hard to see how that would happen right now. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think that in part is also hard to like, um, to me, it is hard to look at what that would look like um, post the storming of the Capitol, right? Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. well, you know, like I, I, to, for me, like that, that incident is certainly like, <laughs> I keep thinking about that incident every, ever since it happened as I'm reading all of these things, right? Because like, what is it, what was that really about? you know, um, and 
you know, somebody posted on Instagram this um, cartoon, editorial cartoon that um, that had like a, on one side of it, it had a picture of like a Black Lives Matter protester and uh, the words under it said, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. And then on the other side, it had a picture of people storming the Capitol and underneath it said, we love you guys, you know, and like, thinking about, you know, a, a movement to try to address this. I can't think about this and not think about, I can't, you know, it's just like, oof, <laughs> yikes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, so even he's saying that in September of 2020, like it's just, it's different even now, less than a year later, because of the way events have unfolded. So, you know. Well, and to think about what tactics might be utilized or what, what can be utilized, um, or if you're thinking of like the Black Lives Matter movement as a civil rights movement, like one of the things that was an early ask was to like, you see a traffic stop, you start filming it so that there's evidence. And then what have we seen how many black men have we seen die on film and nothing is really, you know, like if you're thinking about Selma as like a moment where then people saw it and said, this is not okay, but now we see it every day and people are saying it's not okay, but it's not having a lot of, of movement. It seems like, um, and yeah, especially post capital storming, like what tactics will be effective? I don't know. So these sort of almost felt like closing thoughts, right? Like normally I would say like, what are your closing thoughts? So I think that I'll, I'll ask like, what did, what did this book make you want to learn more about? Um, or alternatively, like, what what else are you reading or wanting to read that will you know continue to fill in knowledge about how, how our country works there's actually one thing i just um watched on netflix which um really tied into this I mean, he talks a lot about the 14th amendment in this book and um there's a new series called amend and it's hosted by will smith actually he goes through six um different segments and it's about the 14th amendment the entire thing and how it was created and how it's been used and um it was really informative and um it also just for me it tied in nicely with this book because it gave me an extra understanding of when he's saying like this is in violation of the 14th amendment i can see all the places um, where the 14th Amendment is violated here, but since then, or, or how, that, how an amendment can build strength and change and grow. Um, so it, it just, it, it was really interesting and I learned a lot from it. Um, so it's not something that I read, but it's something that I watched that I would recommend. Mm, I want to learn more about just economics in general. Um, it's definitely a blind spot for me. <laughs> There's bits and pieces that I've picked up, but um, yeah, just all of the, the housing crisis and the housing bubble and banking and, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that I don't fully understand. So maybe, maybe something in that area. I don't know. I also need some comfort shows, just some junk food shows there's a lot to process and <laughs> I know that I'll be processing for a long time, but maybe some junk food for the soul <laughs> would also be needed right now. There's a place for that for sure. Um, the Some of Us is one that I want to read. And the other one, the other book that, um, you know, now that we're like approaching the end of like the list, <laughs> um, the other book that I have been wanting to read, but just couldn't while I was reading these other ones is um, Cast by Isabel Wilkerson. I'm very interested in, um, in what that lens 
um, what that lens does, right? So those two are some that that I want to read, but I probably will um, will take a break from, <laughs> for a little bit. And, I, and you know, I was joking with someone, joking, not joking with someone. It's like I would like to read some books about toddlers right now because that's what I that's what I need to do. I need to refresh <laughs> refresh myself in that area. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys very much for the conversation today. Um, I feel like we were like quieter today, but that didn't mean that we didn't dig in. So I'm really happy um, to have had the experience and thank you guys for that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for hosting. And thanks for picking this book. This was interesting. Yeah. yeah.